We have a green health bar, that is a good sign. And I want to jump right into updates. Yes, you are seeing clownfish babies, but you're not supposed to see that yet. Let's uh, start off with a title for this stream today. Here we go. <laughs> Congratulations on your fish room almost being done. Uh, can I bless it from afar? Uh, let's jump here so we can kind of get the videos to work correctly. Okay, for now I've got you on my big monitor. I'll be bouncing you guys around like I bounce myself around half the time. And uh, <clears throat> listen, okay, thank you for letting me know the sound works. I wanted to jump right into the updates uh, because I have just a couple. Number one, I had said there's a frag swap this weekend, which is not true. So the update is, and I mentioned it in the last video I uploaded, is that the uh, frag swap is next Saturday for DFW Mass, which is Dallas-Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society. And the uh, frag swap will be taking place next Saturday. Uh, if you're a club member, you get in at 12. If you're not a member, you can get in at 1230. And it lasts until... 3 o'clock, so about two and a half, three hours total. Uh, there's enough vendors that we're using two rooms, so there's going to be tons of frags available. I am on the fence. I, I probably will do it, but I hate doing it. Uh, I will probably show up with a bunch of frags myself. And the reason I say I hate it is all the effort of bagging everything up. Just it's the last thing I want to do. That's why I'm not a coral vendor. <laughs> I sell dry goods. I can put them in a box and move on with my life. But... Uh, I might convince myself or force myself to bag everything up and bring... I need to get rid of a bunch of fungias. I probably have 20 of them. And, you know, I, I need to open up some, some sand bed. So that was the first update. I wanted to correct the mistake I said last week. Um, obviously, I've done everything I can social media-wise to tell everyone it's the 24th of February. But uh, I just wanted to... All right, that's it. The second update is the export brick. And that's the brick I got from Brightwell. It, is at, it has now been in my system for 12 weeks. The brick is rated for 1,000 gallons of water. I posted a picture saying that I was doing a review of this brick, and I was uh, stunned by all the negative posts that I immediately saw following my picture of people complaining about um, a brick. And I don't know that it was export. It might have been Marine Pure. Bottom line is... Lots of unhappy people from about a year before had tried the brick because it was new to the market. I hadn't tried it yet. And they were very unhappy because the brick collapsed. It just, uh, just, I don't know. I mean, you know, you start with a brick and you end up with like powder in your sump and it's a big mess to clean up, which I mean, a shop vac will take it out in a minute and a half. But still, it's still annoying when something like that were to happen in your system and, you know, you don't want it to, you don't expect it to. So the update for my brick it's been in the salt water for 12 weeks in the sump uh, after the skimmer section before the return pump where the flow is minimal over it. It's not in a dead spot. It's not in a high volume spot. It's just doing its thing. And the brick is still rigid. I, um, I know that Brightwell had one bad run of bricks. They said that a uh, manufacturing issue and anyone that had a problem, they just replaced it with a good one. So that should alleviate those that were unhappy. Um, if it was that brand that you bought. If you bought Marine Pure, which is the, I guess, competition, and that brick, brick didn't work for you, okay. You know, I mean, that's between you and them. <laughs> but bottom line is, my brick is still intact. I took my fingernail and I pressed down pretty hard, and I basically could press my nail into it, you know, a smidgen, but it was still a solid brick. Now, how is it working on nitrate reduction? Honestly, I expected by now to see some miracles. It's been 12 weeks, and I figured 8 to 12 weeks it would just kick in and nitrates would just plummet, but they haven't. It's been consistently measuring around 40 to 45 in my reef the entire time. And I've been testing with ELOS and with API because I have both kits. In ELOS, the maximum number is 25. So when it's fuchsia, I'm over 25, and it's always over 25. Uh, nitrate on the API kit goes way up to 80 or, or 160 or something, and it's continually, continuously measuring around 40, 45, not quite 50. And so I know it's the same number. Uh, in that 12 weeks, I've done maybe two water changes. And uh, if I were to really want to cut my nitrates in half, I would have to change 50% of the water in my tank and then do it again. And that would bring them down. But I wanted to see if the brick could do it. That's the point. The export brick is um, rated for 1,000 gallons. And my uh, system is 450 gallons, so in theory, one brick should do the job. 
my gut instinct was put in two bricks, but that's rated for, you know, a thousand, no, for, I'm sorry, rated for 2,000 gallons, and I didn't want to overkill to remove nitrate. I wanted to watch the product do its job. So I was actually reached out to by the owner of the company saying uh, we'd like to discuss more with what's going on, see pictures, and back and forth, and they sent me a couple of products. So I got this sent to me, which is called BioKit. I'm sorry, Biofuel. <laughs> I have so many things in my head. Biofuel, and it's a gallon because big tank. And then Microbacter 7, which I already had tons of. I mean, I sell the stuff, so I had bottles and bottles and bottles of it. But whatever, I was happy to accept it. And I was. this is what I'm told to do. And this is what I'm going to keep doing because I really would like to see the brick work. And apparently, there's just not enough bacteria in the system. And so the guys at Brightwell said, we want you to put in... Um, the correct dosage for your tank every single day for the first week and then every other day for the second week and then every third day for the third week and then every you know every fourth day for the fourth week basically just tapering it down to where you get down to weekly and that should kick the brick into overdrive and it should do its job um so being an optimist i'd like to see that work and i'm doing it um being a cynic, I'm like, well, is it the product that's removing it or is it the brick that's removing it? <laughs> but uh, I really don't care. I just want to see if it works. And uh, that was my whole point of doing the review. I, I like to give good reviews. I never want to do negative reviews. And that's not me being, um, uh, um, it's not me pandering to vendors. It's just, I'm, I'm a positive person. And if I can find something good to say about a product, I'm going to do it. And if I have nothing nice to say, I just keep my mouth shut. You know, there's no reason for me to go out there and, and berate and put down a certain product or a certain thing. It's just not what I do. Matter of fact, I'm a, I, I'd like to think I don't complain very much. And uh, I, some of my friends might beg to differ, but I really, I, I tend to stay on the positive side of things. Um, quick side story, and I'll get right back into it. Um, I went to my favorite restaurant which is called Razoo's, and they serve Cajun food, and I love their ribs. And uh, this was a few months ago. I went in. I was in the mood. I wanted their ribs. I ordered the ribs, and the ribs came to the table, and they were horrible. They were so bad. I couldn't believe it. They were. I literally could not eat them. And, you know, I had some corn on the cob. I had some fries there, too. And when the waitress came over to see if we were happy, I said, no. These are really, really bad. You should never serve these again. I don't know what's going on. And the manager came over, and you know, he wanted to follow up with me. And he, he, as he walks up, I just kind of looked at him like this. And he just nodded his head like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> In his head, he's thinking he's not just trying to get us you know, for a free meal. No, it was so bad. You couldn't even cut it. Normally, the meat just comes off the bones. This stuff was like leather. And the uh, store manager told me, we changed meat vendors. And I said, well, you've got to change back. This was the worst decision you guys have ever made. It's the one meal I always get in this place. I've probably had it 20, 30 times because I love it. And this was absolutely uneatable, you know, unedible, inedible. So I, um, he offered to give me another one. I said, what's the point? It's the same vendor. Forget it. I don't want it. I'm, I'm not hungry anymore. So, you know, he comped it, uh, which was fine. Um, I was disappointed. I left without a full stomach. Uh, but the point of the story was, you know, so I, I'm not really, I'm not really a complainer, right? The person sitting across from the table said, if he's complaining, this must be really bad because he never complains about anything. <laughs> and I kind of looked at him and I was like, wow, it's kind of a nice compliment, you know? So anyway, my point is, is that we should focus on the good. We should try not to, you know, tear each other down on the negatives. And, you know, that's my uh, PSA for the day. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, I, I mentioned in the title, I'm going to show it on the screen one more time. So, difficult discussion. I... Um, I'll do this. I have a screenshot here. This was posted <clears throat> on YouTube last night, and it caught my eye, and I felt like this information needs to be discussed. So I'm going to make this big enough for me to read it. 
And basically the question for the live stream was, when you have lost a fish, after knowing that you've done everything you can to put it consistently in near perfect conditions, what are your feelings? Should we all feel guilty to come uh, to some degree if there was nothing we could do differently? And basically what it is is that this person is heartbroken over the fish that they had that's died. They had it for five, six years, and this, and this NASO died, and they took it really, really hard. And there are people in this group that are going to completely relate to that. They are going to completely understand how important it is about these fish. I mean, how you spend every waking moment thinking about these fish. You go to bed, you wake up, you check on the tank first thing. Uh, you feed these fish, you keep their, their uh, environment pristine, and you, know, you become attached. If you're like me, you name them. And uh, they're your pets. You know, just like someone has a cat or a dog or a turtle or, or a hamster or whatever it is they have, our fish are our pets. And a Nassau Tang in captivity has been known to live 35 years. Um, and so when you have one that's five years and, it, and it's been with you daily and then it dies, like in the case of this person, it's really heartbreaking. Now, I, I can totally personally relate to this because of this fish right here. Um, this clownfish in the upper left corner, I'm sorry, I can't zoom these images in. Um, that's a true percula. And I got it in 1998. And in around 2002, I learned that there was a pair of captive, oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, that's right. A pair of clownfish that were raised from eggs in captivity somewhere in Florida that were um, 25 years old at that point, at the time of that story. And then five years later, I was told they were still alive, which made them a 30-year-old fish, you know. And so when I'm looking at my clownfish in my tank, and I'm thinking, you're going to be with me for 30 years, it's really important to me. And I loved that clownfish. And as you can see on the left side of my screen here, I had an avatar. And back in the old days, uh, when I was on forums a lot, I had... All kinds of funny avatars. This one, someone photoshopped me, my head onto this great body, and I, I used it because it was hilarious. And uh, I was just like, you know, that's fine, whatever. And, you know, it, the best part was under my name on the forum, it said I was pro a professional stripper. And so <laughs> it led to some really funny discussions. Uh, you know, people were just like assuming all kinds of stuff about me. And I was totally fine with that. It, it made me laugh. And, um, you know, from time to time, I would give them examples of my work. And back then, in those days, when you put a link to something, you would basically just put a word, like, example. And they'd click it, and it would take them to God knows where. And uh, it was funny, because we were like, are you really a professional stripper? And I'm like, yeah, I've been stripping for 17 years. And they're just like, really? You know, like, it must pay really well. Your tank's so pretty. And it was the best inside joke, because I would say, here are samples of my work. And I was like, if you click it, if you dare. And they'd click on the word samples, and it would take them to sparkling floor service, where I stripped and waxed floors every single night. And they'd go, oh, you got me! And I loved that joke. It was my ongoing running joke. I ran with it for a decade, if not longer. Uh, matter of fact, if I were to continue that joke today, I would be a former professional stripper, because I don't do it anymore. But, uh, so that was great. And, you know, these avatars, I, I tended to stick with one. I know that a lot of people, at least back then, would rotate through avatars. They kept changing them all the time. And when they changed their avatars, you know, I never knew who they were. Because I'm used to seeing a certain image, and I knew that was connected to a name, and I would just read the conversations, and then all of a sudden they changed it, and it was like a stranger to me. And I didn't realize they just took a new picture. Uh, you know, now on Facebook, you see people changing their profile picture all the time. And uh, uh, me, I tend to stick with one, and people actually recognize my posts more quickly on that forum because of it. And I posted there a lot. I did the same thing on my local club forum. I posted a lot. I've probably got 100,000 posts out there on the web at this point. But um, back to this picture here. Uh, this was because I had a terrible day. I woke up one day, and my beloved clownfish that had been with me for 12 and a half years had died. And it made zero sense. Because this fish was fat, thick, happy, laying eggs, uh, was paired with a great partner, they were it, the the fish I'm talking about is the bottom one. The upper one is the male, uh, but that bottom one was the percula as she's putting down some eggs again. She was midlife, you know, even younger than midlife, and completely active, eating, swimming, you know, just involved. And then one day I woke up and she was completely cocooned. It was the weirdest thing ever. 
there was this ball of gel around her body. And she was in the center. Like a big softball of clear gel. I had never seen anything like it. I still don't even know what it is besides I know it's bacteria, but I don't understand where it came from, what caused it. Uh, back then I was dosing vodka and I asked uh, one of the authors of the vodka dosing article, is there any chance that this gel was a uh, result of the vodka dosing, which he said no. But it was horrible to see my beautiful clown just dead in the middle of this cocoon of clear gel, you know, like preserved, but bloated and, you know, just dead. And I was so upset. And it was really stuck in the rock work too, which is even worse because I couldn't remove it easily. And I had these really long, uh, uh, like, pincher type things. They were like, sort of like scissors, but they had like a little pincher at the bottom. And I could kind of reach in and grab the uh, the tail of the fish and kind of pull this orb off the rocks. And it, it took some time to remove it. But... I didn't even have a good plan of action besides get it out of the tank, you know. So here I'm trying to lift this thing up. And, you know, it's this big ball with a clownfish inside and the pinchers are holding onto the tail and I'm lifting this ball upward. And as soon as I broke the surface of the water, I'm thinking, what am I even putting under this to, you know, get it to the sink? And, you know, I didn't bring a bowl. I wasn't prepared. And as I lifted it out of the water, the weight of this thing made it collapse. I still had the fish, but all the gel went everywhere in the tank. And I thought, oh my god, number one, I didn't know what this stuff was. And uh, I was afraid of it getting on other stuff and killing more fish or killing corals or whatever. So I got the clownfish into a bowl on the sink, you know, I thought, I, how stupid was I? And when that stuff hit the water, it was right in front of a Vortec pump that just went poof, and just sent it everywhere. And it was clear, so you really couldn't see it clearly. And I had to use a net and go back and forth and back and forth in my tank to scoop out all the gel I could. Um... And I, to this day, I don't know how that clownfish died. I don't know what caused its death. But it had been with me for 12 and a half years. I was expecting to live 25. I had a tank full of life and happiness. And when this fish died, I was so upset that I put a black bar on my avatar. Like you see police put the black band over their badge or on their sleeve, you know, when they lose one of their, the force. And uh, I kept it like that for about a month or so um, because I just felt really... I felt that loss deeply. And uh, so when I saw this post by this person last night feeling terrible about losing a certain fish because, you know, that person, I, I don't know if this is a man or a woman, um, that person had other fish and, you know, things go wrong, but certain ones we get really attached to. And like Spock has been with me since 2004. Uh, that Nassau Tang is supposed to live 35 years. And, uh, you know, of course, when I got her, I didn't know it was going to be 35 years. <laughs> Years. That's a long time to commit to a pet. I mean, it's awesome, but I mean, anything can go wrong with a reef tank at any time, and uh, that's that. So, to go 14 years, and she's lived through two tank leaks. She's lived in a trough for seven months. She lived in a temporary tank for 18 months. You know, I've had to catch her and move her, and you know, she hates that. And I don't blame her. I, I don't think I'd like if some giant box came down and scooped me out of my house and dropped me in another house. You know, but. Anyway, I was trying to give her a better place to live. Um, but if and when I lose her, it's going to be really hard because I'm so used to her and she's been with me for so long. And it's not wrong to feel that loss. And I'll tell you this. The one thing I did not do immediately was get another clownfish to fill that void. That's, that's not how I'm wired. I kind of feel like, let me just suffer the loss. And then later on, you know, I'll, I'll look at getting something else but for now I'm not trying to fill it immediately with another one and that's that's my uh, my viewpoint or my uh, my feelings on this matter it's it's really hard especially if you're trying to tell someone about it and they don't get it and you know so in a, it's kind of we're right back to what I said before if you have nothing good to say say nothing at all um, if this is a close friend you can definitely share your feelings with them and they should listen and care and you know if it's just workmates, you know, you probably don't even bring it up because you're not going to want to hear whatever stupid thing they have to say. <laughs> I, I'm just assuming they're going to say something stupid because they're not tethered to the situation. You know, unless they have been following your tank, you know, consistently because you're always showing them updates and stuff. That would be different. But yeah, uh, so I get it. I would definitely recommend that you um, just... Deal with the feelings you have now. Focus on everything good in your tank. That was what I had to do. I had to think about all the good things still going on when I lost that fish. Because I was so upset 
I was at that point where I was like, I'm just going to take down the 280 gallon reef, you know, because of a clownfish, because of one little fish that died out of a thriving reef. And uh, yeah, I, I had those feelings, but you know, it was just a feeling. It wasn't an action. I didn't do that, obviously. And I would definitely say focus on good things in your tank. Look at the other fish that, you know, you've been probably ignoring in, in comparison to that one that mattered to you the most. And, uh, you know, focus on corals for a while. You know, kind of get in there and, you know, clean up the tank really well and make sure all is well. You know, it probably is already. You know, sometimes these things happen. Like I said, I don't know how mine died. I don't know how this NASO died that... um Power Slayer was talking about. But the bottom line is, is that it's going to be a void. There's going to be something missing. And I'll tell you this, this is going to be the weirdest thing for you of all if you're watching this right now. If you end up getting another NASO down the line, uh, let's say in three months, six months, a year from now, and you drop it in your tank and your tank's still the same, it's going to be really weird because it's going to be like a miniature of what you had before. Um, and it's kind of remarkable. You don't even realize how large some of these animals in our tanks, you know, in our care are because they were so used to them. We see them every single day. And you don't see that it has become this large, you know, and then you get this new one. It's like this. And you're like, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, like in my case, Spock. If I were to get a new NASO, it would, of course, be a very small one. And I'd be shocked at how tiny it is compared to the anemone or compared to the acros or compared to what Spock is. And uh, that's happened, too. I uh, had this long-nosed hawkfish that was horrible. Um, I got it to uh, control my, um, my bristle worm population. I had too many. I had thousands and thousands. So I put in this, this long-nosed uh, hawkfish. Do you guys know what that looks like? Um, give me a second. I will pull it up. I can type. And we're going to need a window. What if I use this one? Oops. Sorry, guys. Uh, give me one second. I should never multitask on the fly. Close this. We're going to change it to... Mm, maybe this one? Yeah. There we go. Okay, so this is a, the long-nosed hawkfish that I had. And this fish eats the visible bristle worms. So if you have too many, it'll keep the, con the population under control. Well, this fish was being super mean uh, to copper band butterflies, which was crazy because the hawkfish has no swim bladder. It literally jets from here to there and perches. And yet, instead, what it was doing was it was constantly chasing a butterfly fish, which is a known fast swimmer, and chased it to death. It literally didn't make it. So I uh, said, okay, I got your as long nose hawkfish. And I, it's got to go because I like copper bands more. And the, in the end result, I ended up later on getting another long nose hawkfish. And it was so tiny compared to the one I'd had. And I was just like, wow, I had no idea how small they, it was at one time. It just, it's funny how we forget. Anyway, that's pretty much what I had to say on that part. Now, let me get back to you guys, because I've totally ignored the chat. All right, let me see what I've missed. Give me a second here. Okay, one person asked the question just now. Uh, when a snail died in the frag tank, it smelled really rancid, and... Uh, Yes, that's absolutely the case. When it comes to anemones or it comes to uh, uh, snails, those things, when you pull them out of water, if they reek, I mean, they are done. And uh, it, unless this tank is really small, like we're talking about a biocube or something like that, most tanks can rebound pretty well from something being removed that's died without having to do anything special, like anything to remove ammonia or anything. But whenever you have doubts uh, and you want to just kind of make sure the water is safe, you can go ahead and you can put um, some Prime in there. Prime is from Seachem, super uh, inexpensive. One bottle will last longer than it should. Uh, I usually say buy a new bottle every year. Just keep one bottle on hand. It's emergency stuff. And one capful treats 50 gallons. So if you have a, a big bottle and you need a couple of capfuls for your tank, see, you have too much. <laughs> but don't use some that's five years old because it won't help your tank. I, I, just, I just know it won't. 
just get a new bottle every year. It's going to cost you like eight or eleven dollars or something like that, and just have it on hand. It's great for emergencies. It locks up ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, chloramine. It locks up everything, um, and allows you to filter it out via your skimmer. So I recommend uh, Prime. Kevin Keener, uh, you're kind of jumping ahead on me, but that's fine. Uh, March 3rd, I am going to be at ReefWorks, which is a uh, expo. It's going to have coral vendors, it's going to have dry good vendors, and it's going to have me as a speaker. And as far as I understand it, I'm speaking at 1030 in the morning, and then afterwards, it's going to be a... Um, uh, I think then the show floor opens up after I'm done talking, and then it's all about selling. That's what I'm told. So that is your answer, sir. Or, or ma'am. I don't know. Mandrake Fernflower? That could be a man or a woman. It's a username. I have no idea. Uh, Doc Cecil loves their Marine Pure. Okay, good news. Uh, okay, let me ask this. Those of you using Marine Pure, what is your nitrate level? Post it in the chat. I'd like to see some numbers. All right, let's see. Uh, sometimes the audio on these live streams doesn't line up with the video. It could be possibly because I'm doing things on the computer. Uh, like I'm seeing what you're seeing and that loop-de-loop -loop may be throwing off lips to sound and I apologize. I don't really have a cure for that one at this time. I haven't figured out if there's a way to like watch you guys on a completely different machine and that way this machine is just streaming outwards uh, that might solve it um but i'm not at that point yet um <clears throat> bees reef says i was distraught when a three-month-old clownfish died let alone five years so you see it it doesn't even have to be something you've had long term you know if you feel like you're doing a good job and then something just goes wrong despite you know, your best efforts, you can, it can be hard to deal with. Uh, Claudius asks, have you ever used oysters for filtration? I have not. That, um, I think you'd need a lot of them. <laughs> you know, like imagine a refugium is just lined up with these guys and they're just filtering. It would be kind of cool. And, uh, I think it would make you pretty unique because most people are not doing that. And so I think you'd get a huge following if you had a build thread talking about that and showing good results. That would be the best part. Let's see. Um, Dalton says, what did I miss? You missed nothing. What you can do is you can watch this later on when it uploads fully and see it from the beginning. Uh, nitrate, 0 0.05. Wow, your test kit measures low. Um, another is measuring at 10. Nice. Ah, but this person using... No, that's interesting. Okay, so I need to discuss that too because running Marine Pure with no pox is apparently a no-no and it literally makes those bricks collapse it, it, because I think there's some kind... Don't quote me. Well, I mean, quote me, but I could be wrong. Um, I was told that the structure within the brick, you know, the, the, the elements that make it up, that there's wood in there, and that no pox just erodes that, and so it, it weakens the media and makes it fall apart. So the general rule is don't use no pox with a marine pure brick. So I'm amazed that's working for you. Let's see. Uh, since we're talking about losses, I'm going to tell you guys another story that happened to me. Um, it was... My worst reefing accident ever. Hands down. And it was completely my fault. I, um, I used to keep sun corals in my 280-gallon reef. And I had them right there in the front, and they were beautiful. I had them with some dendrophilia, and I would feed them every single night. And uh, to do that, I had to turn off the return pump, and I had to turn off the Tunzi pumps that I was running. And uh, I just had to stop all the flow in the tank so I could feed the sun corals. And I always had mice uh, on hand that I would melt, you know, from the freezer. And I'd add some tank water, let it sit on top of the tank, it melts in five or ten minutes, and then I would take a turkey baster or a small pipette 
and I would slurp it up and I would feed each individual polyp. You know, I just feed all the sun coral polyps because I love them. They're beautiful. And I'd been doing that for a long time. Well, for some reason, this one night, um, I had the TV on. Um, I was supposed to feed the sun corals. And, uh, you know, I, I set it all up. I turned off all the pumps. I started melting the food. And I don't know what came over me. But I was like, man, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. And I went to sleep. And uh, the next morning I had to get up early because someone was coming over. Uh, we were working on a sump for him together. And when he, uh, you know, he rang the doorbell, of course, I rolled out of bed. And I, I'm, I'm kind of, my hair standing up and I'm bleary eyed and I can't really, I'm not awake yet. And I walk past the reef and, you know, I go to the front door and I let him in. I say, come on in, I got to use the restroom, you know. And as I'm, you know, coming out of the restroom, he says, why are all your fish on the sand bed? And I was like, ha ha, that's really funny. And I'm looking at the tank and all the fish were on the sand bed. And I'm just like shocked. And I'm looking at the water line and it's like it's down an inch below the trim. And of course, no movement. And I'm just like, oh my God. And then, of course, I see in the upper uh, left corner of the tank, there's that bowl of mice's food that's been sitting there all night. <sighs> None of the corals were affected. Every single coral in the tank looked completely fine. They were super extended. All the polyps were out. They were beautiful and vivid. And I mean, this was first thing in the morning. All the fish were on their way out or dead already. It was horrible. Of course, I ran to the back of the tank and turned on the return pump, turned on the tonsies, turned on everything. I was like, you idiot, how could you do this? You know, and I was like, and I'm looking at the fish and Spock was in that tank. And she was face down in the sand, you know, mouth in the sand, but still moving. And, you know, I, <clears throat> I this is so long ago. But I feel like I reached in, because I was removing the fish that had died, and it was, it was heartbreaking. Um, I think I helped her out of the sand, get her mouth out of the sand so she could breathe. <clears throat> and, you know, she kind of jerked, and I, I thought she was brain damaged because she was just, like, swimming erratically and slamming into a coral and then bounce off and then slam into another coral like she was blind or, or drunk, you know, and, you know, I'm sure it was lack of oxygen. And it was horrible. And I was looking at her like, oh my God, she's like a bulldozer. She's going to wreck the whole reef as she goes out. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was one of those moments where you don't know what to do. Do you touch her? Do you leave her alone? Do you, you just hope for the best? Do you interact? Do you hold her? Um, and, uh, you know, getting the flow in the tank, getting oxygen. I put an air stone in the tank immediately to add fresh air as well and had that bubbling like crazy. That day was horrible, but it wasn't as bad to me even though, I mean, it's weird. You'd think I would say it would take it way worse. But that mistake, that was 100% my fault. Worst mistake I could possibly make as a, as a tank owner. Turn off all the power and go to bed? What, what the hell? And it's like, of course, I never did that twice. But um, half the fish in my tank died that day. And, of course, the fish that died were all the difficult ones to replace. You know, like copper band. I'd had it for five years, and I could not get another one forever until you finally see this one in my reef now. I mean, it's, it was like a decade till I got one that would stay alive. Um, powder blue tang. You know, those things are ick magnets, and mine was fat and happy and beautiful. Lost her. Um, flame angel. 50-50, right? Because they either eat corals or they don't. I had one that didn't eat corals. Dead. Um, trying to think what else I lost. I think I lost a... Uh, couple of hippo tangs too. I don't know. It was a lot of losses. And the weird thing was they literally probably died minutes ago. I mean, just, just before I woke up, like they finally succumbed because they all had all their color. Nothing was missing. No cleanup crew had tried to devour them. They were thick. They were vivid. As I was lifting them out of the bucket and holding them in my hand, I could realize how large they were. And I just, I had this bucket of all these fish that I'd killed and it was really hard. And to prove that I'm still not the perfect reef keeper, even though this one was beyond my control, I yesterday walked into the kitchen and found a clownfish dead on the floor. Uh, it, it jumped, and uh, basically what's happening is the clownfish and the anemone cube, are they've been in there for three years now, roughly. And uh, they are getting more and more aggressive toward one another. They're being bullies. I've already had to remove three from that tank that you know, they were rescues you know they were near the surface of the water and i'd put my hand in there and they would swim into my hand for safety and i'd lift them out and just go put them in the other tank in the frag system but um i've had a couple that have been like staying near the top of the 60 gallon cube 
and you know the other clownfish go at them but they usually dart somewhere else and uh, this one jumped out of the tank and it was still soft it was still colorful it was not breathing i tried holding in front of the flow for a few minutes and i think it was too late as well so i had to throw them out and uh that was sad putting a cover on top i don't think it's going to solve the problem honestly i mean besides i don't pick up a clownfish off the floor but if the other fish are attacking that fish with a cover on top, it just means that they are going to bite and attack and rip that clown to shreds and uh, until it's gone. I mean, if they don't like it, they don't like it. And it's, it's kind of annoying because, you know, you want to have a tank full of clownfish long term. And anyone that you speak with that has a tank full of clownfish will tell you the same story. It works initially. It'll work for a while. It won't work forever. And... You will either be removing some clowns and putting new ones in, or you will watch the population dwindle down. You know, in the, in the end, there can only be two. It's one of those situations. But that tank right now still has about 12 clowns in there. And uh, I think the only solution is going to be to remove all of them and get myself a new clutch of 26-month-old clowns and start again. But I'm not at that point yet. I'm uh, just letting them do their thing and... It was just sad to lose a clown last night, but it wasn't a heartbreaking moment. It was just like, oh, you know, I wish that hadn't happened to that fish. So, all right. Let's see. Uh, TJ Howell, excellent uh, point. I'm going to read it exactly as you wrote it. I have everything set up my apex to turn my pumps on after feed mode, so it won't happen to me. I've never done it, but I'm pretty forgetful. So, yes, if I had used a feed mode to feed the reef, uh, feed those sun corals, instead of turning off all the pumps manually like I did, then even if I had forgotten, if I had gone to sleep, the pumps would all resumed after, let's say, 15 or 30 minutes, and that would not have happened. And all of my tanks have the battery backup on them now. So they, re they keep power to all the pumps, even if the, the main flow dies. But if I physically turn off a pump... Um, a battery backup won't help me either. I mean, literally, you have to have some kind of movement in the tank to keep the fish alive. They need the oxygen. But as I said before, the corals, they didn't care a bit. It was amazing. You would think that low oxygen environment would affect corals too, but they never looked better that day. It was crazy looking. So, all right, guys. Uh, we're about almost 45 minutes in. Now I'm all in depressed mode uh, thinking about these losses. It's sad. Um... I've been trying to share some happy things on Instagram, so be sure that you're following me on Instagram. That that little group is growing. Uh, somebody mentioned on there recently I should be doing more on Instagram. Um, I guess I need you to tell me what more you want me to do or how often, because I feel like putting one thing up there a day is good. I, I, what do you do? Do you put up a lot of things on Instagram? Do you just is it every hour, all day long? You know, obviously, you know it's. You can only show a fish or an enemy or a coral so many times. I don't know. Yeah, tell me what you think. <clears throat> I've been, uh, I did my water tests. Yay, got them all done. Got to put these in Reef Trace. <clears throat> and I think the Reef Trace app is like late. I think it was supposed to be out last week. So I haven't heard anything. So I guess it's coming out this week. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, current situation. Oh, another update. I knew I had another update. It wasn't in my list and I knew I'd forgotten what it was. All right. Three months ago, I filled up my calcium reactor with the dead corals that we had removed from my reef that I had rinsed and, and baked in the sun and dried out and crushed down and filled the reactor. And the reactor is, you know, dissolved it all down to about this much left. And I am going to uh, have to refill it this weekend because I need more because my alkalinity right now is at 8 dKH. And I like it to be a little bit higher. Um, and it won't go higher because there's just not enough media in the reactor. Phosphates, we're measuring 0.1. Uh, nitrate, you already heard. Calcium's 400, magnesium's 1300, salinity's 1.026. Uh, <clears throat> temperature 78.5, and pH was 8.23. Uh, also, here's a funny thing that happened. I did share this on Instagram and uh, not on YouTube. I um, got some peppermint shrimp for the anemone cube because I have some aptasia in there, and I want them gone. And I'm too lazy to kill them myself. <laughs> I mean, from time to time, I get really aggravated, and I start killing them, but... I was like, let me get some peppermint shrimp. I forgot those guys will do the job for me. And so I went to the fish store down the street from me, and I bought six peppermints, which is probably more than I needed, but I thought, there's a lot of Aptasia. Let them eat them all. And uh, the weird thing was, in the two-minute ride coming home from the fish store, 
you know, I literally picked up the bag, walked out the door, put it in my car, got in my car, drove, lifted the bag, came inside. During that two minutes, one of those shrimp had molted, and so there was a molt floating in the water. But what I didn't see, or didn't understand, you know, because, you know, they're, they're going to shed, and usually they shed because they need the space, you know, like they're growing, and they have to throw that off so they can get a little larger. But um, maybe this was a stress reaction, because after it molted, and I have pictures, um, one died. And I'm going to assume the one that molted is the one that died. In that two-minute ride, one of my shrimps was dead. And I thought, how did it even die? All it did was throw off its exoskeleton. I'm wondering if the other five shoved their little claws, their little club claws, into its soft, tender, meaty body and killed it, like, through its heart. I have no idea. I mean, it didn't look damaged. But I was just like, how does this die in a bag that fast? So... Uh, last night I went back to the fish store and told them what happened and they gave me a replacement, which was nice. Um, and so I have six in the tank now to start devouring Aptasia. And I'm hoping, someone, some people have said, please film them eating in Aptasia. Well, I think these guys tend to work really well nocturnally, which means flashlight duty, catch them in the act, hope they don't run away when the light hits them. I'll see what I can do, but there's no guarantees that that is going to uh, be filmed. But if I can just tell you, guess what? I have half as many. <laughs> You'll know what's going on. It ain't me. It's going to be what the shrimp are doing. They, um, the, the water that they were in, uh, I measured the salinity, and it was 1.0 to 1. And uh, so it took a while to get the acclimation of the bag <clears throat> up to 1.026 to match my system before I could release them. And I was kind of surprised that the shrimp at the store were at such low salinity. That doesn't make any sense. And so I told them, and, you know, when I was going back for the replacement one, and uh, he measured it in front of me, he says, tank's 1.024. So I came home and I measured it three times on my refractometer. I was like, no, it was 1.022. So 1.021, 1.022, it's a little low. And so I let the store owner know. And, you know, he can check it and verify and all that. Now, you know, maybe they need to calibrate their refractometer. I don't know. But um, obviously, when you're acclimating any kind of livestock to your tank, you want your salinity and you want your uh, temperature to be the same. And in the case of this with shrimp, which are sensitive, the fact that it was uh, that low, I had to be more gradual. So I, I used a little cup of a, you know, like a little, like one of these things. And uh, I scooped some water up and poured it in the bag once or twice. And I waited seven minutes and I did a couple more. And when the bag was getting too much water in it, I poured some of the water out in the sink and hung it back on the tank and added a little bit more. Basically, doubling the water volume in the bag is usually my method. I went a little bit further because I was trying to get salinity right. Once salinity was correct, then I would scoop them out with my hand and I released them into the tank. Uh, very carefully, matter of fact, because all those tentacles, um, I took my hand with a shrimp inside and lowered it in the tank and opened my palm and they crawled off, went down the silicone and onto the sand. And what did I do with the dead one? I dropped it in the tank because I figured someone would eat it and it went right into my bubble coral. My bubble coral said, thank you. So nothing was wasted that day, other than the molt. The molt ended up in my sink, which is funny. I was trying to wash dishes, and there was this weird thing on my hand. I'm like, what is this? And it was that molt, and it was sticking to me. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, Aptasia are not my pets, but nice try, Linda. Um, Aptasia are glass anemones, so technically they should have the right to live in the anemone cube. But man, they're brown and stringy and ugly, and they just kind of ruin the look of the tank for me. And uh, hundreds, I want them down to one or zero. I'd love zero. I'd like to just be done with them. I'd almost like to just take my copper band out of my 400-gallon reef and drop in the anemone cube and let him just kind of whittle them all down. But uh, I'm not going to do that. I thought, let me let the permanent shrimp do it. Rich, you love my channel. You don't even have a tank. Let's add the word you forgot. Yet. You're going to get a tank, and you're going to be super happy, and you're going to have all this beautiful stuff you know, to look at in your tank as well. <clears throat> Mandrake fern flower. I had a peppermint die after five hours in my tank. I can beat that. I had one die the moment I added it to the tank because a fish went over and chomp and ate it. That's why I'm so protective when I add them now. And I put them in my hand, and I lower them in the tank, and I release them where they can duck into the rock work or into a coral and not become someone thinking, it's krill, it's krill, I can eat it. Not everything I put in the tank is food, you fish. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, speaking of molting, molting shrimp or shrimp that throw off their exoskeleton is completely normal. 
And if you're not seeing that happen, if your shrimp just seems to stay the same size and just never seems to molt, that's a good indicator that your iodine is low in the system. And the easiest way to dose iodine that I know of is to get Lugol Solution, which is a product that most fish stores sell, and if they don't sell it, you can get it online, Lugol's Solution. And one drop is used per 50 gallons of water. So if you have a 100 gallon tank, you need two drops of this stuff once a week. It's really easy to dose, and you'll, if you start dosing it because you weren't, you're gonna notice that your shrimp are molting more often and get, they grow bigger. So it's kind of, kind of fun and exciting. Do not overdose iodine. Whatever you do, do not overdose it. I'll tell you another quick story and then we're gonna wrap this up. Um, years ago when I was told, oh, you need to dose iodine, I was like, okay. And you know, I bought my bottle of Lugol Solution and I had a 29 gallon aquarium. And you know, I had my, the clowns that we were talking about at the beginning of this presentation and the anemones and the cold coral and the clam and all the things, you know, it was a nice reef. And I was just told you need to dose iodine. So I put in one drop and I was like, what did that do? That didn't do anything. So I put in a second drop <laughs> because I'm an idiot. And um, I, that second drop hit the water and the clownfish were gasping and it was like, <clears throat> like they couldn't breathe. And of course, now what do you do? There's no iodine remover. I'm just like, oh my God, I killed my fish. And uh, I got really lucky. Uh, whatever happened, it was very temporary and the fish recovered. But I learned a valuable lesson. You put in the right amount, you don't overdose. And uh, so two drops in a 29 gallon is a terrible decision, especially if one drop is good for 50 gallons of water. Even with a sump, you know, when you take out sand and, and rock displacement, you know, your water level is not going to be tank plus sump. I, that's a, a thing that a lot of people do. I say, you know, what size is your system? And they tell me this and I'm, I, I never believe them. Unless their sump is radically huge, which most people don't do. Uh, normally, the amount of sand and rock in your tank that is displacing water, the amount of water in your sump equals that rock and sand. So like in my, ta my uh, system, I have a 400 gallon tank. I have a 60 gallon anemone cube that's technically 460, right? And then I have a sump underneath that holds around 70 gallons of water. Well, that would put me way over 500 gallons, but I know that's not true because number one, my 400 gallon doesn't hold 400 gallons of water. That's an external measurement. And you take the internal measurement and you take my four inch sand bed and you take all my live rock. And all of a sudden you find out that you have maybe 300 gallons in there, 350. Um, no, it's a little higher, it's around I think it's around 360. The anemone cube is a 60 gallon top to bottom, you know, completely, but that's got sand, it's got rock in it, and it's down this far from the top. So I basically think I have 450 gallons of liquid volume in that entire setup, even though others might just add them up. So always take whatever the water is in your sump, I just say that replaces the rock and sand that's in the display tank. So 400 gallon tank, even with a sump, it's 400 gallon. All right. Um, right. I'm going to stop. I think that this is a good place to break off. Uh, like I said, I'm sorry I started a little bit late. Um, take care of your babies. Do your water test today. Make sure that everything's doing well so that way next week you can come back and tell me good news. Oh, next week there will not be a live stream because I will be at the frag swap. This time I got it right. <laughs> and then March 3rd, I will be in Seattle, Washington for ReefWorks Expo. And then on March 17th, I will be in Indianapolis for their frag swap. So these are three different places that you can find me. If you're in the local area and you want to come to Dallas-Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society's Frag Swap, dfwmass.org is the website. Once this video publishes, I will put links to all these events again in the video description down below. And uh, come hang out with us at the Frag Swap, or come hang out with us at the Expo, or come hang out with us at the other Frag Swap. Frag Swaps are great places to get good deals on corals, and you can find frags that are $5, $10, $15, hundred dollars you know there's all kinds of things to pick from and you'll find some beautiful thing that you would love to have um in your tank that will grow into a gorgeous colony you know in the next few months so getting frags this time of year is great for summer because you're planting things and then in a few months you start seeing some really nice growth you guys have a great weekend and i will publish some videos during the week i've got a couple i want to roll out and uh no live stream next week but then as soon as we can do one again, I will, of course, send out a message and announce it to you guys. But typically, they're Saturdays at 2 o'clock unless I'm not around. Bye, guys. Happy reefing.